Before time immortal, the dark and stormy nights arose from creation's primordial nectar. Brought to this world as both muse and master to deliver mortals from misery and the mundane. Welcome, lords and ladies. It's the dark and stormy nights. <laughs> Oh, uh, oh, and here we are. We're 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 live. Me me oh. me me. Hey well, guys. Recording the whole time. This is the dark and stormy <laughs> nights. Uh, Indeed I'm, it is. I'm Loki. I'm here. I'm Odin. Are we starting? You, you said that like you weren't sure. Well, are I, are I, you fucking Odin or aren't you? I, I'm confused. Jesus I, Christ. I I don't know what what's right, going anyways, on recording at so this point. Uh, we flubbed this up and we're back. And uh, of course we had an interrupter, an intruder, or whatever it was. Not not really an intruder, but whatever. <laughs> Whatever. Are we, are we really back, don't, or are we starting over don't, here? Don't look at me like that. <laughs> so. I don't know what just happened. I don't either. Anyways, so <laughs> life. There was that issues. Thing between plans. We are back. We're gonna start this over. Are we okay ready? Then. Is everybody on page? Yeah, okay. I. I still ain't. But <laughs> all right. So uh, Tyr wrote you some lovely, lovely letters today. Did I? And uh, and she's gonna read those in a little bit. And uh, Odin wrote a piece of his today. So what are we doing? What are the chapters you guys did? I. That's where we left off. Me wondering what the number was. So you don't know what you wrote. I wrote chapter ten. Oh, ten. I called it Revenge so of the Clones. So that means you started eleven. Part one, right? Okay. So ten and eleven. Well, yeah, but I read the first part of chapter ten last time, I believe. And you're finishing up ten. Finishing up ten. Good to know. Okay. So, do you want me to go ahead and read? Oh, if you want to start now, go ahead. I mean, it's up to you. Yeah, it's fine. Uh, so once again, Odin forgot to start the timer. I gotcha. Homeboy, oh oh it's running. Hey, somebody remembered, huh? <laughs> okay. Um, I didn't even know we were alive. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, all right. Are we good? Am I gonna go ahead here? Yeah, Odin's <laughs> just Lord. gonna go I take apologize, his medicine. I apologize, people. While you, uh, <laughs> while you read. Um. Wilhelm reluctantly opened his eyes, not at all eager to start his day and face the consequences of his actions the night before. Between the wolfsbane and the wine, he'd not been at all his usual cautious self, and it had cost his team. He wasn't expecting that they were very happy with him in the aftermath of their long night. As it was, Wilhelm was already the oddball of the team. Despite his supernatural status, he wasn't as deadly as they were. More brain, less muscle, metaphorically speaking. Despite all of their bickering, the rest of the team were much more alike, all deadly in their own right. And then there was Wilhelm, a member of the team, yes, but not quite the same. He had no doubt that they cared for him. He was humbled by their rescue, but how could they truly accept him when he struggled to accept himself? He'd always held himself apart. As much as he hated admitting it, he feared being judged for his differences. In the process, he'd made himself a bit of an outsider, and it probably didn't help that he'd now dragged the rest of the team through the mud in his careless plotting. Being the brains of the planning was one of the few things he offered his team, and he'd most definitely messed up. This morning was not likely to be a happy reunion. With a heavy sigh, Wilhelm dragged himself out of bed, his anxiety ratcheting up as he went through his meticulous morning grooming ritual. Every step completed was one step closer to facing the firing squad, and whatever disaster was still left of the house surely wouldn't improve anyone's mood. Unable to stall any longer, Wilhelm made his way towards the parlor, giving himself a mental pep, pep talk along the way. It would be fine. Mary would never throw him out. Um, the team needed him. They trusted him. But then, as always, there was that little voice making him doubt himself, reminding him that maybe it wouldn't be fine. Mary and Hammond and Zara were all smart in their own ways. Did they really need him after he'd screwed things up so badly? Allowing himself to be taken in the first place and then leaving them to fight an army alone and then putting the house in danger. Was any of that forgivable? Was his part in their lives and in their team uh, really more important? No, he shook his head at himself. They did care about him. They did want him around. They wouldn't have gone looking for him if they didn't but they could only accept who he pretended to be, the voice reminded him. They only saw the parts of him that he, sh that he allowed them. Would they still want him if he stopped trying to make himself different, if he stopped forcing away the parts of himself that he couldn't accept? Wilhelm had worked himself into a nervous wreck. His chest constricted, and he fought hard against the wolf that tried to take over. Will, honey, are you coming in here, or are you going to hide in the hallway all day? Karen's voice called out to him. 
Started out, startled out of his struggle, Wilhelm stepped into the parlor, a little sheepish at being caught. He usually tried to keep those parts of himself under wraps, but Karen greeted him as if nothing was out of the ordinary, even when her eyes flicked over his head, and he realized he hadn't completely held the shift back. Come on in here, honey. I have your tea right here. Karen was sitting at the desk in front of the job board, a teapot and several mugs in front of her, tapping away at the telegraph machine to her left. She lifted the teapot and a mug to pour his tea while one of her legs continued their message and two others worked on a delicate knitting project. It was then that Wilhelm noted the spotless parlor. His eyes widened as he glanced around the room, not a thing out of place, not a, tr uh, not a trace of the destruction that they'd come home to. Earl Grey, one sugar, just like you like it, she offered up the mug. Dale looked up from the breakfast Karen must have given him and trotted over to Wilhelm in greeting. At least the pig was quick to forgive. Thank you, Wilhelm muttered, trying to make sense of this strange scene he'd woken up to. Distant arguing alerted him to the approaching team, and Wilhelm stiffened in anticipation of the scolding he was about to get. You almost took off my head with that thing. Why are you even carrying it around still anyway? Hammond huffed. Her name is Betsy, and she needs a good polishing after that bloody mess last night. Wilhelm winced as they turned into the parlor, but he was met with silence. Zara and Hammond stood in the doorway, wide-eyed and taking in the sparkling room and the newly appointed secretary. Karen's perky voice beckoned them closer. Good morning, Zara, black coffee, here you go, dear. She offered up a steaming mug to Zara and another to Hammond. Hammond, black tea, extra strong splash of milk. Karen quickly picked up the ringing phone with one of her free legs while Zara and Hammond looked to Wilhelm in question. He was saved from having to come up with any kind of answer by Meredith's voice from the other room. Um, okay, Poppy, thanks so much for letting me know. I'm so sorry for all the trouble, but I'm glad to hear that you're all right. Within moments, Meredith appeared in the parlor, also stopping to take in the spotless room and the new assistant. <coughs> Karen quickly ended her call and offered up the teacup to Meredith. Tea extra strong, shot of whiskey. Mary's eyes widened, but she accepted the tea gracefully. How do you know so much about us, Zara demanded. Well, honey, I ought to know after stalking you all for months. Their jaws dropped in shock, but Karen chuckled with a wave of her hand. Kidding, just a little assassin humor. Nothing to worry um, about. My predecessor told me everything I needed to know. Show me showed me how all this works. She tapped the job board with a free leg and gave me some tips on keeping our team happy. Your predecessor, Wilhelm questioned. He'd, been, he'd not been gone long. Had they hired a secretary he didn't know about? Robert, such a lovely gentleman. We had a long chat, shared some ideas, and he taught me what, what I needed to know to keep all of you at the top of your game. Mary looked worried at this news, and Karen was quick to reassure her. He's not going anywhere anytime soon, honey. He could never move on at a time like this. Mary nodded. So you can see him and talk to him? When my energy's at the strongest, uh, when I've recently fed, I can see spirits and magic more clearly, but it fades between fe feedings. With a sigh, Mary turned to the team. I called Poppy this morning uh, to find out what happened. She couldn't identify the people that broke in, but she did say what they were looking for. What is it, Zara asked. A pig. The team all looked at Dale, who was still sitting at Wilhelm's feet. His eyes widened, and he backed up to hide behind his legs instead. They want Dale, Hammond questioned, looking at the pig with a curious expression that Dale did not like one bit. Why? The stress of the situation finally proved too much, and Dale let out a little hiccup as his body burst into its strange two-legged form. Just as quickly, another hiccup shrank him back into a pig. Well, obviously, we can't let him have them. Uh, have him, Wilhelm insisted. Obviously, Mary agreed. Even if he hadn't grown to be a part of our team, whatever they want him for can't be good. There's magic trapped in him, Karen offered. They want to take it, and you're right. Whatever they need it for cannot be good. Blood magic rarely is. Mary paused and bit her lip, not wanting to upset Wilhelm with her next bit of information. Poppy also said that Philip had come looking for you, and she told him you'd been missing. After they managed to clear the house, Philip mentioned that he was still looking or that he was going looking for you. She said she gave him his, her business card, but hasn't heard from him. She's worried he may have found the trouble he <coughs> went looking for. Wilhelm tried to swallow past the lump in his throat. His stomach twisted with concern, and he once again struggled to fight against the wolf that wanted to take over. Setting down his tea, he started to pace. He needed to act fast. Where would Philip have gone? How could he find him? Wilhelm was vaguely aware that his team was observing his frantic behavior, 
that was a little too intense for a missing acquaintance, but he would worry about all that later. All of his energy was going into holding back a wolf and a panic attack. A crisis over exposing hidden pieces of himself to his team would have to wait. A locating spell, he murmured as Mary went to answer the door. Hmm, that could work, but we'll need something of his to make the spell work, Karen pointed out. Frustrated, he spun again, nearly knocking over a small ta uh, table with his tail. He stalked forward to res resume his pacing when th uh, their visitor stopped him in his tracks. The scent hit him first, warm hints of honey s mixed with pine and just a touch of wildflowers. Wilhelm's gaze snapped up to meet shimmering green eyes filled with emotion. Philip, he breathed, before throwing himself into the man's arms. Wilhelm tucked his face into Philip's neck and his scent oh, let his scent surround him. His wolf calmed and the tightness in his chest eased. Philip pulled back and cupped Wilhelm's face with his large hands. I'm so glad you're okay. His deep voice rumbled through Wilhelm, calming him further. And then Philip's lips were on his in a long, lingering kiss. It felt so right that Wilhelm didn't even have the ability to be startled. How could he be when Philip's kiss felt like coming home? Like everything was finally hugged uh, exactly how it was supposed to be. Wilhelm sank into the comfort of the big strong bear, and when Philip finally eased away, he allowed his eyes to open, praying that it wasn't a dream. Well, that explains a lot, Karen commented be from behind him. Wilhelm's eyes widened in horror as reality crashed back in, reminding him that their reunion had an audience. Philip winced and gave him an apologetic look as Wilhelm spun to face his team. Karen was grinning at Philip. Honey, I'm so glad you stopped by. I'm telling you, this one can give a girl a complex. Seeing no hostility in Karen, Wilhelm's eyes turned to Mary. Philip, it's so nice to finally meet you. I'm so relieved that you're well, and thank you for helping Poppy last night. I'm in your debt. She planted a kiss on Philip's cheek before returning to her tea. Wilhelm turned to Zara, and the knot in his stomach loosened further at her reassuring smile. Then he turned to Hammond, who was staring at Wilhelm and Philip a little wide-eyed, clutching a huge metal dragon to his chest. This time, Philip pop, uh, piped up behind him. Um, that's fantastic. Is it a flamethrower? Hammond glanced down at Betsy, then back up to Philip. Um, yeah, her name's Betsy. Philip smiled. She's a beauty. What kind of range do you get on that thing? Hammond puffed up his chest and patted Betsy lovingly, pointing out a valve that adjusted the flow of fuel. At full strength, 20 meters easy. 40 if you're not worried about hitting a target, he chuckled, pointing out the red zone marked on the release valve. Philip whistled low and clapped a hand on Hammond's shoulders. That's impressive. I knew a fellow who used to work for the government, creating various prototypes. He couldn't get near that range on a flamethrower. I'm glad Wilhelm has someone like you keeping him safe. Of course, Hammond agreed. You got yourself a good one there, Wilhelm, he added, going back to polishing Betsy. Ah, I see you're still using the board I made you. Looks like you've made some updates, too. Philip looked over the job board, plucking a note off Zara's name field. Um, he poked at the stick sticky substance and then stuck the note to the board again. What is this, he asked. It's web, dear. I needed something to help keep those notes organized. Philip looked like a kid in a candy shop. Karen, this is fantastic. He plucked a notebook from his pocket and began scribbling notes. Karen pulled the notes off the board and handed one to each of the team. These are the jobs that came in this morning. A brownie was spotted in the park across town. A call came in saying that Baba Yaga is living in the woods behind their house. If that one's true, tell her I said hello. It's been a while. The team stared at Karen a little stunned, and she cleared her throat nervously. Not that we're friends or anything. Terrible what she does with the eating children thing. Karen cleared her throat again. <coughs> a message came in from Lady Whitby, who swears her house is haunted. And one of your neighbors insists that a gnome is trying to build a home on her property and steal food from her garden. The team all exchanged looks. These all came in this morning, Zara asked. Karen nodded. And we're charging an extra fee for the short notice. I'll need a rundown once you return so I can bill accordingly based on the work involved on the extermination or relocation. Zara nodded and patted Wilhelm on the shoulder as she passed to get her weapons. Philip stopped in front of him a moment later. I have to get to work. Call me when your job is finished and let me know you're all right. Philip brushed a kiss to his temple, and Mary shared a soft smile with him as Hammond stalked off grumbling about a brownie infestation. His morning had turned out nothing like he'd expected. Everything had changed, and yet it felt exactly as it should be. A weight had been lifted off his chest, and he felt free for the first time in a long time. With a smile of his own, he headed off to research gnomes for what was sure to be a simple relocation job. Okay, that's it. Nice. I uh, <coughs> I appreciate the invention of the post-it note. Yeah. 
<laughs> so now I we don't know, know if Romeo and, and Michelle would agree, but <laughs> uh, the uh, the the future inventor of the Trapper Keeper mm-hmm. also had a hand in Post-it notes. Well, I mean, organizational office supplies. He yes, he is a purveyor of organizational goods. Right. Uh, and uh, and I think Philip proves to be the real hero here <laughs> with a little help from Karen. Agreed. Clearly, so clearly. This is so hilarious. So I'm re 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 reading the magicians, uh, the second book in the series, and in it they're talking about how there's this cult, this like you know kind of like a uh, hippie commune kind of thing. To post it, it notes. And it falls. It f- it collapses in on itself and becomes a silverware company. So it's just kind of funny that <laughs> you're basically building these all into like becoming some kind of office supply moguls instead of what their actual job is. No, it's just no, Philip. no, just Philip. Just Philip. Philip already works in the organizational supply. Wait, did Philip uh, supply these post-its? No, no, he got the idea from Karen though. Oh, okay. He stole Karen's idea. Yeah. He created the job board. So. He's gonna open up Office Max or whatever. Open. He already owns Philip the Philip Von Trapper <laughs> is the... Keeper. <laughs> oh, God. ...is the heir to a, 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 an organizational supply company. Can you imagine a weirder group of uh, advertisers? Uh, or will we be happy to receive? I don't judge, man. I mean, <laughs> brilliance comes from anywhere if given the opportunity <laughs> to bloom. So, I, I uh, don't know I who I said I that, but I did just now. <laughs> <laughs> Waxing poetic with alcohol. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, I can't find fault with anything. Um, it was all good. Find fault. I thought it was funny. I thought it was cute. I thought no, it was No, no, that's what I'm saying. I, I'm, I'm so glad that, that Wilhelm and Philip finally found each other's embrace. Yeah. And uh, I, wh- what, what was it that Philip smelled like again? <laughs> honey and pine and wildflowers. Is that because he's a bear and that he's That is because honey? he's a bear, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't catch that. Okay, that's funny. Like, I caught the scent, but I didn't really make the connection. <laughs> A That's bear, funny. honey. So he has Winnie the Pooh. Yeah, I thought it was cute. <laughs> <laughs> it was better than the pick a nick basket. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Philip, why do you smell like a pick a nick basket? <laughs> Come on, boo boo. It's a little early for a happy ever uh, Let's after. Go I get feel some like pies. they're going to have to break up at some point. Maybe get oh, back together. Oh, leave Wilhelm be. You can make Zara and okay. have a break up. You know me. I'm, I'm not a believer. Besides, in this happily, isn't a happily ever, ever, after. ever after. This is one kiss. No, that's what I'm saying. You're but like if anybody's gonna make it, it's gonna really be mid with the book. This is this is a piece of Wilhelm that he thought would not be accepted, and that he had to keep apart from his team, has been revealed. His team accepted him, and this no longer stands between them. Okay, that that would be the only thing I would imagine. Um, well, I don't know if it's a movie snatch or whatever, but there's like a British derogatory term. That they said, the, uh, the k- one character said it in an endearing, teasing way that guys do with each other, not in necessarily an a-hole way, but it definitely can be taken that way. But I think it's poof. I would feel like Hammond would, would deride him a little or give him a little bit of a crap. Like, because he uses coarse language. That's who he is. You know what I mean? Well, I think that she, she did a good Hammond's job. also Scottish. Tyr did a good job of hijacking any of Hammond's judgment by immediately yes, having that him. that was clever. Yes. Um, Having Philip intervene. Well, yeah, Philip. Philip comes in with a with a compliment, and Hammond can't resist a stroke of the right, ego. Right, because his ego, yes. Right. So, so that so was yeah, kind was of brilliant. making Philip protect Wilhelm a little. Yeah, it's it's almost as though she knew the characters. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, all right, I'll tell you what. Why don't we take a take a little break, and we'll, we'll come back after these messages. <laughs> we'll Sounds good. We'll get together after a few words from our sponsors. How many have you had? <laughs> <laughs> like four. <laughs> we'll be back. <laughs> in a topsy-turvy world, it's nice to have something that makes sense. This is a knit, but we hope you enjoyed anyways. So yeah, we're back. Uh, <laughs> I know it was terrible, Stewie. Right? Was it? <laughs> yeah, it was yeah, a bad. Stewie. That was a bad one because I didn't yeah, get it. I did better the one off the air, but. Anyways, all right. So Odin, you had something to say. Oh, I was. Um, Tier was asking off air if yeah. there was any complaints, and I'm like, no, I'm not holding back. Uh, in fact, I, I I related to his um, neuroticism, his r- reticence to uh, like going out because like you know you you, you may oh yeah yeah coming out to relate. the 
coming out into the parlor or the kitchen or whatever. Right, right. You know, he gets maybe he blacked out. Maybe you did or said certain things. Well, he then did things he, get he up knows. And face people. He knows what he did. Uh, he over. He of course overthought the reaction to it. And he had a couple of roadblocks that were kind of working in his favor too. Right. But eventually, yeah. got to get right. out. I, mean, I think that maybe his do? team probably would have been a bit frustrated, except they woke up to a sparkling house, everything taken care of. Right, a right. Cup yeah, of did tea. she? That, I, I do wonder about that. Does she plaster work? Because yeah, <laughs> that, that that wall by the stairs is screwed. Well, she um, is magical. That's what I was gonna say. She has access to magic. And so any broken furniture. Webbing is as strong as steel. So on her still scale, to smooth that out. Uh, I don't. Know. Strong maybe. as steel. That's what, yeah, if you well, weave, if you weave webbing together in the same Maybe she just moved the job board over so it covers and it's only the And <laughs> it's only the drag line. They well have, they have did, multiple different kinds of threads. I, did, I don't remember if I described it on the show or in a picture or something. They have a lot of pictures. On the yeah. Walls. Also, what? like maybe she pulled a Fantasia Portraits. and just, you know, sent the broom and mop and everything a to little, life and it fixed the house. bippity boppity boo yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, I, I mean, there was that one guy who was currently alive. He could do a little what? blood magic. Who knows? Uh, I don't know. I feel like Karen's kind of not feeling the blood magic. Just I feel like Karen, you know, snacked on whatever was left there. Uh, That's I, true. I think she's a little neutral towards uh, crack open a cold one. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> um, okay. No, I I liked it. I thought it was good. I thought it was sweet. Uh, I thought there were some good funny bits and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Maybe a few crunchy bits. <laughs> so. All right. So. Odin's going to have the uh, coming up piece, okay. right? And you're doing chapter 11, right? You're st- is yeah. this the whole thing or just part? It feels like the whole thing. Uh, I wanted to do a different thing, but based on the advice I was given last week, I went this direction, and if it doesn't work, we adjust. But this, you know, from what I had to work with and the time I had, because I had a small trip to take and different things, um, I'm pretty happy with it, but you know, we'll, <laughs> I don't think we'll, we'll see if you are. Oh, okay, all right. So, uh, okay, are, are you gonna read now? Yep. Okay, he's gonna read now, guys. Okay, all right. All right, listen up. <coughs> Hammond shifted uncomfortably in the trolley seat that he barely saw over. His overstuffed rucksack took up as much room, uh, took up much of the room, nearly forcing his face into the next seat. That coupled with his diminutive height afforded him little in the way of a view aside from the overly decorated hat belonging to the old woman who sat in front of him. He shifted his vision to the window seat where Zara lounged comfortably. She was bedecked in faded blue, hunting leathers that aged to green at the edges and collar. Hardly typical feminine fashion for the day, but Zara cared little of such matters. With her legs crossed and her head drooping to the side, one might suspect she was asleep, but she watched the gray early morning world go by through her slitted eyes. Hammond stu- stood and pulled the rope that ran along the window, which caused a qui- uh, quiet jingling by the driver. The trolley slowed to a stop, and, then, and they disembarked. This part of town was rather still. Away from the hustle of downtown, most who worked in this area lived on premises though a few of the servant class could be seen walking briskly down the sidewalks. Hammond plodded along, carrying a worn leather rucksack nearly as big as he, while Zara looked for a carriage to porter them to their destination. After nearly 15 minutes, she found a handsome cab that was was returning from a drop-off that was willing to cart them to the address she provided. Let me help you with that, good sir, the carriage man said to Hammond while trying to heft his overburdened rucksack. Leave off, Hammond barked. That'd be specialized equipment. Hammond shrugged his shoulder forcefully and climbed into the cab. The carriage man raised his eyebrows and then settled into a practice neutral expression. Twenty minutes later, they arrived in front of a moderately lavish estate. Well, perhaps a few decades past its prime. The estate stood amongst some of the most beautiful homes to belong to anyone outside of nobility, like a fly in soup. It boasted a large lawn and gardens, which had turned brown and leafless. The roof had rotted out and caved in in parts. Spanish tile had long ago lost its grip and crashed on the flagstones below. A minefield of detritus and debris separated them from the front door. Quiet, Hammond croaked. Barry. Zara agreed. Don't like it. 
Zara walked up to the front, uh, walked up to the door and lifted the old black iron knocker as the door creaked open. She turned and locked eyes on Hammond as she held the knocker. Hammond slipped a strap off his shoulder and dropped the rucksack. He pulled out the brass dragon-headed blunderbuss contraption that he used to roast the spiders and slung it over his shoulder. Can't be too sure. Not going in there with me, Nico's done. Let's not torch the client's house down, eh? What oh, client? You see anyone in there? Any lights? You had anything? Nay, he challenged. Then I'm going in prepared. He continued to dig in the rucksack, which engulfed him in, uh, to the sternum. Irritably, he withdrew and turned the rucksack over and shook it violently. All manner of blades, tools, and what one could only assume to be weaponry spilled out. He picked up a small pistol and a large silver knife. He strapped a dull gray tube with a large tin box affixed to it over his left shoulder and began stuffing the rest of the uh, contacts back into the sack. How do you even move with that much crap on you? Zara asked quizzically. Low center of gravity and a strong back, lassie. He nudged uh, Zara to the side and peeked in. The room was dimly lit with diffused sunlight, shining through grimy, unkept windows. There were large sheets, aged yellow, draped over the furniture, and cobwebs crisscrossed the room. Hammond removed a metal sphere per perforated with holes with a sheen like nickel from an inside jacket pocket. He turned the top half from the bottom until it clicked four times and tossed it into the room. A dull yellowish light softly lit the center of the room, but did little to the corners of the immense room. Satisfied? Zara asked impatiently and then forced her way past Hammond before he could re respond. She drew two large curved daggers from each thigh and advanced into the room. Who's the client again? Hammond asked as he followed her into the receiving room. A lady Whitby, according to the ticket. Perhaps this is her, isn't her primary residence? Let's hope not. Oh. A loud crash interrupted them. Turning, they, they saw something small dart by. Hammond trained his brass blunderbuss in the direction the beast fled as Zara investigated the source of the crash on the far side of the room. She came upon a shattered Chinese vase that had been knocked off of a library table, spilling desiccated flowers over the slate tile floor. Probably just a rodent, Zara called out to Hammond as the sound of a cat being strangled ran out from over by Hammond. Hammond booted the sphere of light towards the sound, but it bounced off of a heat register and revealed little else. He looked about suspiciously as he lowered himself down on to one knee and then bent to put his ear to the register. He heard Zara's boots as she approached behind him. Anything? Don't know the last. Don't know. He turned to the eye Zara to see if she had a better bead on the situation as eerie harpsichord music began to play somewhere on the other end of the house. Hammond got up without a word and pocketed the orb after clicking it once. He walked away from Zara and resigned to the fact that this was likely a trap. He exited the room through the door on the far side and found himself in an impressive hallway filled with paintings. He chose the first door opposite he came across and found himself in a small solarium set for tea service. The plants were vastly overgrown before they withered and died. The vast windows were obscured by overgrown shrubs, leaving little light making the room altogether claustrophobic. Sarah pushed past Hammond, nearly knocking him into the, cart, uh, to the tea cart as she peeked out the opposite door. It opened into a back hallway and staircase. The music was louder here and seemed to come from upstairs. She began to skulk up the staircase as Hammond st stomped on after her. I can't scout with you making a racket. Wait until I go up there before you follow, she shout whispered at him. She continued, to caref uh, on, she continued on carefully, uh, oh, I'm sorry, she continued to, I don't know what I grammatically did here, careful to step on the side of the stairs, which they didn't, uh, where they didn't bow and were less likely to creak. The hallway upstairs was less grandiose, but still filled with paintings and doors. The runner was of a cheaper make than the one downstairs, but still left a uh, little bare wood showing. The sound grew as she approached a room that overlooked the front door. 
An elaborate black harpsichord, gilded in gold leaf, stood on the far side of the room in front of an impressive window. It was opened with a Baroque painting set in the lid that covered the keys and a scene depicting Venice painted on the door above the strings. There appeared to be no one in here to play it, and yet it continued to execute a complicated, if not tinny, piece. Hammond loomed behind her, and she nearly attacked him before picking up his scent. One part machine oil, one part sweat, and one part ham sandwich. He walked around her and reached into the harp portion of the tiny Baroque piano. He did something that immediately silenced it. That, that's when the, uh, they heard another sound, a bubbly and plopping sound like stew or arterial blood. Hammond wheeled around and locked eyes on Zara. Uh, they both pulled weapons and looked about. It was maddening as the room had strange angles meant to amplify sound, which meant they couldn't pinpoint the source. An accurate smell like burning sulfur arose, and Hammond looked down at his feet. Thin wisps, thin wisps of smoke curled from the soles of his boots. He stepped away from the spot he was standing on and looked at the rug. Nothing. He looked back at his boots and saw that they continued to smolder slowly. He lifted one leg while leaning on the harpsichord in an awkward attempt to see the bottom of his, his feet, but he was too ungainly to pull the maneuver. Zara, are my boots on fire? No, but the leather has, been, has seen better days. You might want to get a new pair soon. Wait, the other boot is smoking. Yells are too. They both fled the room and looked back. Confusion wrung Hammond's face, but fear was plain on Zara's. She felt rather than sensed the shit behind her and turned with a swipe of the, of the blade in her right hand. It sliced the cheap imitation East Indian rug uh, runner that was coiled up like a snake. The illusion faded once she cut it, and what stood before her was so much more frightening than an animated knockoff. A mass of gelatinous flesh and bone stood before her. It was covered in melted faces. Cataract eyes stared list listlessly from nearly every surface of it and that was not covered in snapping jaws or patches of hair and fur. It oozed clear fluid from a green gelatinous form like a slug or snot. It gargled inco incomprehensively, sometimes sounding like plaintive noises coming from a dying pet and otherwise like a mockingbird trying to imitate a human speech. It did this from all its mouths at once. The combined effect was horrifying. Hammond sprayed the creature with his flame gun, and a, a screeching howl erupted from the creature. The surface boiled and popped, spraying them with acidic bile. Its head dove over its shoulder, and the whole thing shimmied away like a snake flying down the staircase. Zara looked at Hammond as if trying to communicate something telepathically. Touch the house, right? <laughs> Touch the house. Zara st stabbed every rug she came ac across as they made their way downstairs. Nothing reacted. Do you think it got outside? Do you think it could use a doll knob? Did you shut the front door? Shit. Maybe we could lure it out. And what do you suggest we use as... Zara turned and looked at him and... Give me the flame gun and you can be bait. You're faster. Besides... Do you even know how to use it, hmm? You're a rat bastard. Hammond could hardly react. One of the aged sheets that were draped over the sofa jumped up and wrapped itself around Zara's head and shoulders. He leveled his weapon at Zara's form and thought better of it. Zara stabbed upward at either side of her head. The creature lost all pretense of being a sheet, and, a ma and the mass of eyes reemerged. Saliva, slime, and bile dripped from the creature and scorched the rug beneath her. Hammond ran out to the front door and dropped the cylinder weapon from his left arm. He reached into the sack and pulled out a stub-nosed shotgun and began to pack it. Zara screamed from inside as Hammond hurried to ready the weapon. He ran in making sure to shut the door behind him and walked behind Zara. He fired a volley of salt rock into the back of the creature that screeched in horror as loud as Zara. As soon as it was off of her, he set it on fire. It did not move again. The flesh melted from the creature, and the mucus-like like form turned clear and drained like water. All that remained was hair, bone, and teeth. Some of them were human. They just stared at it. 
Guess we don't have to put it down now. Let's get out of here. The door opened and Meredith strolled in. We ran into a uh, snag with a shy spirit, so I sent Will home to do some research. Thought you could use some help. The room plunged back into darkness as the door slammed shut. A curtain near the door was rustling in the wind, but was too long, and the windows were shut. A sheet was oozing off of a wing-back chair and was obs absorbing the bits of bone on the floor. Nope, Zara declared as she took Hammond's hand and pulled him to the door. Meredith looked puzzled as Zara slammed the uh, door open loudly and grabbed Meredith with the other hand and strode out. Burn it down, Hammond. Send the whole bloody thing back to hell. That's it. That's a good cliffhanger. That's not bad. Sure. Uh, I will say the the negative I have is not your writing. It is your acting. <laughs> um, your Hammond is awful. Uh, <laughs> not 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 your writing of Hammond. Uh, um, it is like your he is is stupid Dolph Dolph Lundgren, and. <laughs> No, my only issue with it is that sometimes I can't understand what Hammond is supposed to be saying. Oh, I understand what he's saying. It just doesn't sound good. It sounds like rushish, you know. It's like well, he's you do more Cockney than Scottish. I was doing more Scottish and perhaps. Fair enough. Um, perhaps I may have done it poorly so or too thickly, but there you are. When and if we do the uh, the audio book of this or whatever or you know, if it got big enough for somebody to do that, we pay actors. You know, well, <laughs> hey, hey, guys, tell your friends <laughs> to start listening to our show. Give us feedback. Spread the word. Maybe what's Let's his name for X Men and Split? I love that guy, uh, McAvoy. Yeah, yeah, I love McAvoy. I just saw him in something else that I was like, he's in this. Was, I can't even remember what it was. I think he was in a chick flick or something. Really? Yeah, like it, it just. And d don't get me wrong, I'm not the kind of guy who watches chick flicks or anything. Mm -hmm. It just happened to be on TV. So <laughs> right. you know, that's that excuse doesn't exactly fly now that there's so <laughs> many services. I mean there was a time in the day where there you had four channels and then you had cable and really you only had maybe ten watchable channels. Do you have kids Odin? Do you have kids? All right, fair Do enough. Do your kids hijack fair the enough. TV? <laughs> yeah. Thought so. <laughs> Fenrir takes over the TV constantly. <laughs> Read a book. <laughs> So and if, and if you, you, you mustn't suffer through, if you don't let him take over the TV, he'll bite your hand off. Ooh, true story. So just saying. Or am I super saying? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So no, I, I thought it was pretty good. Uh, I like the whole. I I, I know you kind of made me feel I was in this creepy house, and I like your monster. Your monster is pretty good too. So creepy I know for sure. we've faced this thing before. Yeah, in I wanted something new settings, but uh, but in the in the focus of the story. Well, I kind of fused a couple different monsters together for this one. So, yeah, yeah, no, it was pretty good. It was pretty good. I liked it. Uh, I don't know if I really telegraphed everything. Like, uh, it absorbed a cat earlier on. Uh, oh, is that what was happening? And it I went down the heat register. Okay. It can ooze through things. I kind of like, is that what it sounds like? Does it sound like somebody's choking a cat? Like well, it, it can, it yeah. It probably does I as mean, well. I mean, last time I choked a cat, that was a pretty distinct... I didn't... No. Nice. I never did that. <laughs> but... <laughs> But no, no, I okay. I got some of those. Things. I didn't realize it went down the register, but yeah. I, now Sometimes that you're so are, saying they're it, they're easier to to read than here. No, well, now they say. Well, it, I don't I'm know that I show together, it all, but so I'm, there's little subtle hints, but I don't spell anything out. So okay, I could have dragged it out so much longer, but you know, I don't know. Well, what do you think, Tyr? You got anything to say? I was going no. for humor. No, I thought it was fine. Um, did, did you hear that? Just fine, Odin. It was just no, fine. My <laughs> only question is, like, are we? Are we making it clear? Like, are, are we introducing like the doppelgangers or whatever? Well, I don't think that was clear at all. No, no, it wasn't. It wasn't at all. That's why in the next chapter or a previous one, depending on the order that we end or up inserting at the end. Or is there a part two to your chapter? Well, I do feel that there's War Meredith and uh, Wilhelm going adventure, and so she it'll, never it'll comes over here. Start to become more apparent the more. The story that takes who's place, this Meredith? Right? Where where's she coming from? You know, <laughs> okay. and I think they because they have multiple jobs. They don't go home. They go to the next job. Uh, you know what I feel like is maybe you should have made some kind of mention of uh, like I, I've never seen you wear black before or something like that. You know, like I don't know. Like or weren't you supposed to be kind of chasing tell. after the Baba Yaga or you know something? Yeah, like well, that. well, he did kind of make some kind of mention. Will yeah, I said there was something about a shy ghost. Like they're trying to 
they're trying to track it or and whatever. I think and it, Hammond it, it didn't work, so they sent Will home to do research. Yeah, I think Hammond might accept that. I'm not sure Zara would buy it. You know. Yeah, I feel like Zara and Meredith are pretty close. I don't, yeah, I don't know. Well, right now she's dealing with facial burns and um, wanting the house to burn. So is is it bad? No, I figure. I mean, I don't know. There's got to be some low level acid. You know, surface skin issues. Gotcha. It'll heal. So a little exfoliant and she'll be okay. Yeah, she's probably very red. Yeah. Yeah. That's not good. All right. Any questions? No, I'm good. All right. Does your brain on drugs? That is not. Let's go to break and come back after that. Okay. Sounds good. Dear listener, we accept that we had to sacrifice the whole Saturday for your entertainment, but we think you'd be crazy to miss an episode of The Dark and Stormy Nights. The world sees writers as they want to see them, in the simplest terms and the most convenient definitions. But what we found out is that each of us is a brain. And a dreamer. And a creator. And a basket case. A researcher. And a comedian. Does that answer your question? Sincerely yours, The Dark and Stormy Nights. Liz, 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 listen to Dark and Stormy This episode is brought to you by the letters F and you, motherfucker. <laughs> so that's that's how that would go. Really? Yeah. Did, did you just intro the show with that? I did. I did. <laughs> I did. I, I thought so. so. Welcome back. This is Loki. Mm-hmm. This is Tyr. Odin. Here to tickle your ear hole. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> so anything else about the story that we want to, or are we, are we done? Uh, no, okay, so I think here's what it is. You, you left us in a predicament, I think. Uh, I don't mind it. Mm-hmm. I don't mind the, the, you know, completely what you did there by we got the, the doppelganger Meredith at the end of that. We may want to maybe give a little more giveaway that it's the doppelganger so people, other than the people listening to well, the I show. Well, I think the next story Honestly, should have Meredith and Wilhelm traveling somewhere doing something. We can leave it hanging and just have Meredith Dealing with the Baba Yaga, if that thing is real. Maybe, yeah, that's the other thing we said, is maybe that... Just overlap so and that it's Meredith like, wait, how is Meredith there and here? Right. Yeah, that, that's wor- what I figured. Well, they, yeah, I don't think they were initially supposed to work together, you know, on this, right. so... Well, there's four people in the core team, so right. it makes sense for them to split into two teams if they got a lot of jobs. I mean, you're not going to send one agent on their own. That's it depends. If it's something they can handle, Hammond yeah. can handle a brownie. Although it is hilarious. Not if it's the brownie I in mind. <laughs> is that a pop brownie? No, no, the, the, oh. the king of brownies jumps So are we going to have Hammond like go after a brownie next and the, and one of like the evil Zara shows up and she's working with the brownie <laughs> instead? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, she's laughing at him. Yeah. Like rolled around on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Okay, so essentially we're still left with the need to introduce our doppelgangers because, I mean, that chapter showed a job, and it briefly introduced one of the doppelgangers. Yeah, but there's no way of really knowing that until a follow-up sequence yeah, well exposes I, it. You guys didn't want to like have him jumped and murdered or like hogtied, so we got to do a little bit of an inception. Doppel- dang- we the do doppelgangers slow. don't have to kill anybody. Doppelgangers well, don't. They have just to, need to start causing trouble. They need right, to right. They're supposed to cause find ways to weaken the, the team. team. Right. So that later when they start taking mm-hmm. them out. To force them to maybe want to go on missions alone. You know what? Fuck you. I'm going on this one alone. And now they can get them. Undo the progress that well, we've made. Well, there is actually one That's way thing. we, They've we could make They've made a lot of good work. progress, too, I think. They have. We could, uh, we could actually have it as a rule, for whatever mystical reason, that they're not able to attack themselves. Like, they could attack anybody except who they're cloned from. Like, maybe they'll succeed. Like exist. the opposite of the one. You know. Right. Do you remember? Like Gently? No? Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, instead of growing apart, they wink out of existence. <laughs> Is, no, but, the, I mean, I don't know. You got to know that the other person's got to go, right? So that would still be the truth. It's just you're saying that maybe they can't hurt themselves. Like somebody else has got to do it. That makes doppelgangers kind of suck, actually. Yeah, but they got to play mind games, which is more what you guys wanted anyways. I mean, my whole thing is it's not their mission to kill them. Their mission is to break up the team so that Desmond can get the pig. Right. In the end, really, the goal is Dale. Right. Uh, Desmond's probably <coughs> pissed at the team and probably wouldn't be entirely upset that the team died. Well, not no, only he that, wouldn't you be. Can, with the, with the uh, doppelganger in play, any one of them could just theoretically grab Dale and walk off with him. 
Right. That's Which true. is probably what they really need want to do. But now that they know they're after Dale, he'll be under more protection. Also, the doppelgangers won't be able to walk into the house. So if Dale's now staying with hmm. Karen... So they got to drive it all out. Both of them protected with the house... Well, they do share and Karen some might be able to see right through that shit. The they're cloned from. Oh, that's true. That's they true. They do, but they're also dark. The right. house I, would I protect I against I that. I think the house might Karen, be confused. Karen means them no ill will, but mm. she couldn't get in. We had to adjust the spell to allow her right, in. Right, right. This is true. Hmm. I don't know. So it would be more the doppelganger saying, you know what, Dale needs to come on our next mission. You know, and trying to get convinced okay, them. Okay, that's not bad. Yes, yeah, you know, kinda, some yeah, kind of trickery. I'm just gonna hang out here by the garden and pick some weeds while you guys handle that inside. Mm -hmm. Wait, Maybe weren't so. You, weren't you just inside? No. Right. I'll I'll meet you out front. Right. Maybe evil Hammond, like messing around near the his work shed and right. well, yeah, that's his not love protected. shack. Yeah. Hey, somebody send uh, Dale out here. Yeah. Uh. Hmm. This is very confusing. It's a, it's. A, I think it could be fun, but it's it's very difficult to imagine how this is all going to play out. So y y you're kind of fucking me here because I'm the next one to. Well, I originally I wanted to replace one of them, but you know we, we couldn't agree how Surely. we wanted to go about it. So this is where we I went with it. But at any point, we can still in the following chapters do that. Well, I guess we're okay. So truly, we're what we had originally. Um, go ahead. No, no, it's. I was just asking where the doppelgangers are hanging out by day. I I don't I don't know I don't know that it matters. Maybe they have with an the anti brownstone with the evil ninja <laughs> turtles. <laughs> so like a like I don't know white stone. Or yes, a white stone. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. It's racist. You said it. It's not me. <laughs> don't put this on me now. <laughs> um. But no, what we had originally talked about is like one of the team goes out and meets up with the doppelganger of one of the other teammates. And that's what causes it. Like, and they start putting things in their head about, you know. Uh, okay, I think I understood that. We had mentioned like, we gave the example of like good Hammond goes to his job and bad Zara shows up. Only he doesn't know that it's her. And she starts putting things in his head throughout this job of, you know. Your invention's probably not even going to work, and this, you know, she starts like breaking up the symmetry in the team. Right. That you know is honestly still fragile at this point because they have really just started coming together. Right. Yeah, exactly. I don't know if you caught all. There actually hasn't been enough um, trust and rapport built back <coughs> up to. Right. For the progress that they've made, it still would be easily unraveled. Yeah, we're unraveled. just at a point to where everybody's giving each other the benefit of Which the doubt. Which I try to show some of that in the story because they're constantly shouldering each other who gets to go first and stuff like that. But I Who think there's some bonding. Hammond and Zara? Right. They but is that you, you had both of the actual teammates of Hammond and Zara, not the doppelgangers yeah. in your chapter? Yeah. Those so that's what I'm saying is the doppelgangers would come in and start causing those kinds of problems. Well, I'm saying is they still have some tension. Yeah. Although I think that, you know, Hammond saving Zara as he did was a bit, well, you know, uh, hmm. building, you know, you know. Can we write a chapter from one of the doppelgangers' points of view? Ooh, that could be fun. I don't see why not. What if I like that. What if it wasn't Hammond and Zara all the way through? Meaning? Meaning, what if his chapter... You know what? You could pick up with uh, Evil Meredith showing up. Well, no, I'm wondering if what if his chapter... What, what if Evil Meredith didn't show up? She was That was there. real Meredith? She no, no, no. It was Evil Meredith dropping off Evil Zara, who took Zara's place somewhere through the middle of that chapter. Okay. Okay. And then, you know what? You could have both of them show up. Meredith brings in Zara. And then Meredith grabs the real Zara and is like, hey, I need your help with this. Right. Hammond will be fine. Right. Leaves evil Zara to deal with Hammond. Right. Yeah. Hmm. So that the chapter didn't go exactly <laughs> as you think it did. Interesting. So, yeah, I'm just wondering how you Yeah, you could put it there. You could do it in another chapter. So we'll now I've got to actually like pay attention to what his chapter was. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, m the 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 largest break they had from each other was when the uh, the the Chinese vase falls over. Cause yeah, it's actually, on one it won't work. And it's right at the Why? beginning. Because Meredith only shows up at the very very end. If she's gonna snag real Zara and take off with her, you know, like it would happen like right there. Yeah. Hmm. 
But like you said, we can do this in the next chapter. That's you know, true. continue on with yeah, that Yeah, I group. like the idea of starting with the m- the internal machinations of a villain. So maybe we y- pick up know. the next chapter. Right now you have Good Hammond, Good Zara, Evil Meredith. Okay, so maybe Evil Zara is hanging in the wings somewhere. Okay, your team is about to torch the, the yeah. mansion, right? Okay, so they can leave that to Hammond. Well, Meredith's like, hey, Zara, I need you. He's got this. Let's go. Okay, so Meredith takes off with Zara, and then you can show whatever's going to happen with those two. And next thing Hammond knows, there is Zara with him. Only it's not the same Zara. And th- that's something else that so w- you we might want to address, is that they're, they're going to commit arson for the greater good of humanity and probably not getting paid for this. So maybe <laughs> evil Zara's like, hey, I got something faster than a flamethrower, and she throws a bomb at the mansion. Hmm. And now Hammond's like, hey, you're freaking awesome. <laughs> and uh, just in case it comes up later, the uh, the orb that he clicks that gave off a soft light, at first click it's a really bright flash and then it's out of juice. And that's like a vampire slaying thing. It's so like a, it's it's a, grenade a UV w- bomb? It's sort of, but it has settings. <coughs> okay. Uh, well, that's going to get really complicated really quick. I think we have to map this out. Yeah, I think this is going to take, um, uh, I think we're going to need a lot more planning for the next few chapters because. Yeah, it, we're going to have to really be cohesive <laughs> about this. Yeah, sure this exactly. Just shit out. Uh, the thing on his left shoulder was your uh, Gatling uh, uh, steak gun. He <laughs> never had a chance to use it. And uh, just for shits and giggles, I felt like calling the shotgun Brittany, but it never came up. Brittany. It's not a very, well, yeah, I guess. Brittany we already have a Betsy. A bit of a you know, why not? English name, isn't it? Is it? I don't know. Yeah, no, it is. It totally is. Lucifer's always talking about the Britneys. Well, that's because, you know, Bree's these days. Everybody names. Is that what it is? Yeah, the Bree is Britney? No. Well, there's a lot Brittany's of names better. that shorten to it. I like I Britney better Brianne than Bree. Brit- yeah, that's what I thought. I know, there's I a lot of names trending that are very I similar. I miss Britney's. Britney's were dirty back when I was a teenager. Jesus. <laughs> really? <laughs> Not to my knowledge. Oh, of course, well. my childhood was probably not as good. Uh, it was okay. I don't know. <coughs> anyway. anyway. <laughs> <laughs> it's like wrangling cats. I swear to God, you two. So anyway. <laughs> wrangling pussies. For fuck's sake. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, yeah, I think that we need to build um, kind of a, a bigger overall picture of of our doppelgangers and how we want this to play out. Like, we need to be more specific. Because right, right now we're kind of, we're taking it one step at a time, and I don't think that we see the whole road. And as a group, I think that we're going to have to stick to our framework for these next few chapters. Yeah, this is going to be a little complicated. I think I think the doppelgangers do have a plan. And I don't think that the, the team well has a clue as to what's about to hit Here's them. the problem. That's because we don't have a clue what's the about to hit The doppelgangers. <laughs> right, because we're the team. The doppelgangers <laughs> are as equal and clever as each member of the team. Which right, means but they're the doppel- just yeah. as dysfunctional. They're just sure. as limited. Uh, maybe. Oh, that's a good that's point. That's, yeah, but they have a Robert. Yeah. True. A wise guy, eh? Uh, there might be a little bit of three stooges. <laughs> you know action what needs right to happen? So maybe a Robert's plotting because things. Because that's how the team is in Because he can't be shown. The team is unequal because they have Meredith for Meredith, Hammond for Hammond, Zara for Zara. And then they're even better because they have a Robert. Maybe yeah, but they got Dale, a Dale is the one who needs to save everybody. We were talking about Dale being proper English at one point, right? Like, what? No, like you said he couldn't talk No, anymore. I don't think he can, but oh. I, I think it, it would be funny. I do declare. Oh, you were talking your about shit a doppelganger Dale. I, I do we didn't create one. No, no, no. we didn't. We didn't. But I, 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 I actually <coughs> do feel like he's going to learn to talk, and it's going to be very broken at first, but I think there's an evolution that he's going to have to go through learning humanity. I think, th- I think that would be fun to do, but it should be slow. So, I don't know. I mean... This is going to be a tough one. And especially since our team is... No one's going to be able to kill Robert. Um, no, I, I think this has to be a plan. I think they have to uncover the plot before it gets too far. But I don't think Robert wouldn't know that there's no other Robert. You know? So they would be a little careless with the fact that Robert shows up. That's a reveal. Right. But I say we stall that. That's Let's go saying. through he the chapters. He might be the plotting one. He might be the... 
Uh, He's the organizational one, yeah. yeah. So I think that they go through the few chapters where I mean, we also discuss the issue with can Wilhelm smell them? Right. But we said they smell similar. Right. They every, I think everybody smells them. the same, but slightly. Well, remember, off. Uh, Wilhelm's sense of smell is closest to his change, like the week right, uh, right before and after his change. Right. So he's not always that enhanced. True. Um, we need to write down some rules. Yeah, maybe that's what we do next week. Next week's going to be a full planning episode, I think. Mm-hmm. I think we're going to come up with, we're going to have to come up with the full plot of this and yeah, maybe a few rules to govern it. Right. So yeah, and I think that's what we need to do is we need to keep doing like bits and pieces of the, the doppelganger team, like mixing in for the next few chapters. Yeah, the teams are going to be huge. You got two separate teams. I mean, think about all these moving characters sliding in and out. It, it, it's going to be like a Scooby-Doo thing where they're coming out one door and through another. It, 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 I mean, seriously, if you can picture like all the Benny different Hill, partnerships. That's that all I'm seeing is Benny Hill. Yes. I mean, you're kind of overcomplicating it. It doesn't really need to be all that. You can, I mean, I'm just saying it can be. I'm not saying we no, should. Well, I, I, I saw it as it felt that way. But uh, not that it is that complicated, but it feels that complicated. Uh, that's what I'm saying. That we, I think there are moving parts. Yes. We absolutely all need to be on the same track. Right. Yeah, I agree. Or something's going to get messed up. Sure. Um, but so so far we agree. Robert is the last brick. In Robert the wall. has to come and that, last, and that's a problem. Even Marius, I would stall on. He's hard to fight. They do need to fight him, but they cannot kill him. <laughs> right. He's going to be. He's going to be the hardest one for them to. They're not going to want to hurt him for starters. And he's going to be very good at it. Yeah. Well, I mean, he wasn't really a killer. He was no. a thief. Yeah, Meredith but he was is able still to hold his own, and he's got to have tools however, at his disposal. However, Meredith is now and will always be the most dangerous member of this team. Right. However, um, Robert coming in is going to be the reveal. That's when the team is going to realize. Oh yeah. You yeah. know, this is what's going on. So, so ultimately, that's why Robert has to be stalled until, you know, at least a few chapters out. Sure. Yeah. No, we definitely have to kind of like pick this apart one team member at a time. I agree. And uh, we're just going to have to determine kind of do we start bottom up or does it matter? You know, are we going to go ahead and maybe the first real encounter is like maybe Hammond, the evil Hammond? Thing about Evil Hammond is I don't think they're gonna necessarily. I think know Evil Wilhelm would be entertaining. Like you know, it, he'd Evil just be a Wilhelm, little more snide and confident. I think he's confident. Yeah, that's yeah. the thing. That's what makes him dangerous. He's a giveaway. Yeah. I think Evil Hammond. However, feels like Wilhelm's Hammond. currently like starting to accept himself and fall in love, and maybe they're brushing oh. off his right, personality right, 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 right. changes. Exactly what I'm saying. Yeah. I was just thinking about that, man. Because I, I mean, I With know what I was like. Away, is that you're out on the mission and Evil Hammond is there and there's a brownie involved and Hammond would normally be trying to catch this thing and put it in a jar, right? But what if Evil Hammond just steps on it, like squ- squash? I don't know. Would anybody question would that? Any, that's what I'm asking. Would they question? It? I think they'd be a little like, "What the fuck?" I think you if know? he ate less ham sandwiches. Well, it's just whatever sandwich he can make. It I almost don't always don't is, though. I don't know that. I don't know. I don't know that anybody would point that out as that's not Hammond, you know. Um, you feeling all right there, buddy? However, that's pretty great, though. If we have Evil <coughs> Hammond show up on a job, the brownie doesn't know the difference, and they start fucking attacking him. Oh, it and Evil, Evil Hammond, Hammond! Evil Hammond has no clue what the hell's going on. That's what I'm saying, and I don't think Evil Hammond's going to suffer this. He's not going to have. Oh no! Wait, 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 He's wait. not going to have a moral dilemma. That's He's fine. just going to step. He on can it. start right, killing right. them, but th- if there's enough brownies, they Get can also this. get in some good hits on him. Okay, the king of the brownies wants revenge, right? And I was saying, uh, like, one of the adventurers I thought What if they kidnap Evil Hammond? Well, what I was going to say is, okay, so, like, you know, he gets (laughs) jumped by, like, a whole party of them and everything else, right? And That's some Scooby-Doo shit. Yeah, they they fight or whatever, but in the end, they end up killing the Evil Hammond, and his uh, his blood debt is, is, is drawn. I'm uh, saying. No, no. He's even. And then they find out there's a good ham and still alive, and they have no grounds to attack him. His sins are washed. You know, the contract's fulfilled. Well, it's not just that, but would they really know which one's which? Well, when they run into each other again, because you know what's going to happen. This, mm-hmm. is a, this is a good question. It's an ongoing, like, little you know, I, thing. I think it's funny that Hammond's enemies could end up taking out his enemy. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> it's yeah. like yeah, Jurassic Park. So, so, yeah, in the end, <laughs> the brownies take out evil Hammond. Right. 
there maybe they assume all along it was evil Hammond that was the problem. Right. Oh, and that's not fun. Hammond. No, 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 no. That's what Good Hammond does. He goes, "Oh, well, that was him all along." Right. And then next thing you know, Good Hammond and the Brownies, we cool now. You know, <laughs> we cool now. <laughs> right. Yeah, for a few months. I yeah, don't know. However, it's, I, I think <laughs> that we can have a little fun with Evil Hammond before he gets kidnapped by the Brownies. Yeah, I'm seeing the the scene from Evil Dead. Where the mini ashes right. <laughs> have them all tied up. <laughs> oh, uh, I don't know what we're talking about. Oh, there, you gotta but see it. Okay, Evil but Dead also, three, the medieval one. What if Hammond stole some of his inventions that actually worked before they get him? Like, oh, like, hey, this thing actually works. Oh, like he, like Evil Hammond steals evil? good Hammond. No, 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 Evil no, Hammond has inventions that actually work accurately. Yeah, like, uh, and, and good Hammond's that like, get working and yeah. yeah, see that thing? You know, <laughs> he starts plucking them away. Or maybe, yeah, maybe he's hauling off the coach. All of a sudden, Meredith and Zara are like, Hammond, this is great. It works every time. And he's like, yeah, of course it does. Right. <laughs> you adulted my genius? <laughs> That's how I roll. <laughs> so, all right. Uh, why don't we spend the week coming up with ways we think this should work. And yeah, we'll we're going to have to do some heavy outlining. Out. Yeah, because uh, I think this, this little piece is going to sh- span several chapters. Yes, exactly. And it has to come to the head we bel- we we are thinking it's going to. Yeah, come to. we're really going to have to um, to to stick to the framework Which and make sure it all meets at the right place. I I foresee this being a place where a lot of people would find plot holes. Yes, you know? I agree completely. And so we have to kind of make sure that those don't well, happen. With three authors, yeah. Well, that's what I'm saying is that y- even a singular framework, author. I don't know I where think we're at on that. <laughs> I think this would definitely be where plot holes develop for a singular author, let alone three yeah. authors working together. Yeah. So we kind of have I to mean, be diligent about this. I mean, we've had our overarching skeleton of the story from the beginning. Right. But it's all these, like, subplots and, you know, like the, the interwoven, like the additional villains we've introduced and things like that. Um, that haven't really been planned out quite as well. So, yeah, I know I like where we went with this uh, so far. It's just going to be difficult. So let's get it together. Come back next week. Sounds All good. Right. All right. So don't forget uh, at the dark stormy K1 on Twitter. Mm-hmm. The dark and stormy nights dot home dot blog for our website. Uh, the dark and stormy nights dot podbean dot com. Uh, you can catch us there or uh, dark and stormy nights Facebook group. Mm-hmm. Dark and Stormy Nights Facebook group. Google Play Music and iTunes. And iTunes. Don't forget to like rate us on iTunes and stuff. I guess that's kind of a big deal. Subscribe on Google yeah. Play Music. S- yeah, subscribe. Sorry, here. Check it out. Tell friends about us. Make your grandma listen to us. She can't change the channel. In the that so. is terrible. <laughs> we'll see you next time.